Today we're going over mortgages, and mortgages are a very big part of the project that you'll be working on and making the decision of rent versus buying. Let's review one quick item from last time, which was this concept of secured versus unsecured debt. So secured debt means that there is collateral, which means if, if say, I do not pay on a debt, what will happen is that I will be forced to give up that collateral. That collateral can be repossessed. Unsecured debt means there is no collateral. So say credit card could be unsecured debt and a secured debt could be something like an auto loan or a mortgage. Below I have some links and articles to help you understand the basics of mortgage as well as um, really start to master the concepts that are contained. I am going to be briefly covering the terms and then specifically hitting on a few key concepts that are a little bit trickier to understand. So the meaning of a mortgage is a death pledge, but it's not that kind of death pledge. It's another kind of fun death pledge. So a death pledge, what this means is that when you pay off your mortgage, what happens is that the claim that the lender has on your property then dies and completely goes away. Now, let's say if I do not pay my mortgage, what the lender can do is that they can foreclose. They can initiate a foreclosure to repossess my home. My down payment was, if you remember from section one, I have $100,000 that say this home costs. I have $20,000 in my bank account that I'm going to pay toward this home and I'm going to have a mortgage of $80,000. So the down payment is the $20,000, the equity portion. And as far as standard lengths of mortgages in the United States, they tend to be either you know between 15 and 30 years. In other countries in the world, this actually varies significantly and the structure varies a lot by country as well. But within the United States, 30 years, very common, you know, 15 or somewhere in between. To re-emphasize that one more time, the asset is the value of the home itself, the market value of the home itself. The debt is the mortgage, and the equity is the difference between the two. Presumably, that's just your down payment at the beginning, but as your home goes up or down in value, the equity portion is what changes, so that if the price of a home goes up, your equity goes up, if the price of a home goes down, your equity goes down and could potentially fall to zero if the market value of the home falls to the level of your mortgage. This is an important concept on taxes that I wasn't sure where to insert it, so it might as well be here. As far as what's the difference between a tax deduction and a tax credit? It's really important to know the difference because a deduction just basically takes away from your income on what's taxed. And so this is kind of like saying a tax deduction, it's like saying you earned less money during the year. Whereas a tax credit is that's, if you receive a tax credit for say a thousand dollars, that just goes off, comes off of your tax bill at the end. So which one is better say in dollar for dollar terms, a deduction or a credit? Well, a credit is good, is the better option. A quick example, let's say you have a deduction of $2,000 and your income is $60,000. A deduction of $2,000 would reduce your taxable income to say $58,000. And say a super simplified tax scheme of 10% of your income, that could reduce your taxes owed by say $200. But if you have a credit of $2,000, your taxes owed before, let's say it was $6,000, it falls all the way to 4,000. So credit takes it away at the end the very bottom number of what you exactly owe, deduction, it's at the very beginning and deducts off of what your income, what the calculation for your, your income. The reason for bringing up deductions versus credits now is that many, many people argue that because of the mortgage interest deduction, you could, uh, you should buy a home rather than say rent. Now, the mortgage interest deduction, it, it's somewhat US specific because some other countries have it, but in the United States, it's it has historically been a pretty big deal, although recently not so much. Um, a quick aside, most many economists, basically every economist I've ever talked to about this, 
has had the same opinion that it's it's pretty terrible policy. But with that cynicism aside, we can focus on the the deduction itself, and that if you have enough mortgage interest that you can itemize it from your taxes. Now, just briefly, um, before we've discussed itemizing versus standard deduction, if you have enough individual items that you can deduct from your taxes that exceed a certain threshold, then you're allowed to start deducting it more than just the standard normal deduction amount. Now, this is only for the interest portion, not the principal, and that'll be key at the, in our question at the end. But one of the items to keep in mind is that after the tax changes in 2017, there's just there are just many fewer people who are itemizing. The, the, the number of people who are itemizing has fallen significantly, especially for those who are married. They just don't generate the 20 something thousand dollars that the number changes every year in order to itemize rather than take the standard deduction. So the mortgage interest deduction is not as important as it previously was. So many people who think they're going to get the benefit of say mortgage interest deduction don't ever see that benefit. Now, if the deduction is only for the interest portion, when do you think you get the most deduction during a mortgage term? Between years 25 and 30 or say years through one and five? Something to think about, we'll answer it a little bit later. Now what's an adjustable rate mortgage or a fixed rate mortgage? Well, lots of details below as always, but really quickly, an adjustable rate mortgage is when your mortgage payment can fluctuate over time because your interest rate is changing over time. You are assuming the risk of the adjusting rate of the rate of the mortgage. A fixed rate means you lock in a single fixed rate and you will make that same payment for the life of the loan or at least the required minimum payment for the life of that loan. Now, what is the primary difference between them? Well, in just an adjustable rate mortgage, they tend to offer them at slightly cheaper rates. However, you are assuming the risk if the rate is to go up significantly. With a fixed rate mortgage, you're going to pay just a little bit more, but you tend to not assume the risk. That means whoever's lending you, say the bank who's lending you the money is assuming the, the, the risk, the interest rate risk associated with that mortgage. Now there's this hybrid in between this adjustable rate and the fixed rate. They're called hybrid arms. Again, we're not dealing with the appendages of mutants. It's basically a combination of a fixed rate and an adjustable rate mortgage. Now say like a 5-1 arm means you have a fixed rate for five years and then your mortgage adjusts every year after that according to an adjustable rate mortgage. Or a 10-1 arm would be 10 years fixed and then every year after that it would be, it would, the mortgage would adjust as an adjustable rate mortgage. Now some people might think interest rates, they haven't gone up in many, many years, let's say at the time of recording this, and they aren't projected to. But you know, if there's a big spike in the variable rate, that could cause some hardship for you in your situation. So this is kind of like the inverse of insurance as far as getting a fixed rate mortgage. You could go with variable on a mortgage if you can afford a large increase in payments because you'd be projected to save some money if you go with variable. But if you go with fixed, you're going to pay slightly more, but you don't have this looming risk in front of you. So, I mean, if you're buying insurance, this is a fixed rate mortgage is like having an interest rate exposure insurance policy. All right, just to touch on a couple others that are more common in other countries. Um, interest only and balloon payments. They're more common outside the United States, but they still exist inside the United States. Uh, you basically should not be engaging with these products, uh, mostly because of their complexity and you probably don't need that complexity for your life. There are very specific circumstances where they might make sense, but for the vast, vast majority of people, it's just, it's probably not the best option. Also, there are reverse mortgages 
And a reverse mortgage is basically where, say, the bank pays you every month instead of you paying the bank. Well, that's nice, or may seem nice, but it's basically they're just giving you a mortgage small bits at a time. Um, financial advisors recommend against it for, for most cases, probably. But there are some, there's lots of fine print involved, but the main thing to remember is that in very specific circumstances, a reverse mortgage might make sense. And really, that's going to depend on the circumstances of the household involved. Below is an example of a 30-year mortgage. Is this 30-year mortgage, is it a fixed rate or is it an adjustable rate mortgage? Well, you can tell because the monthly payment does not change over the 30 years that this is a fixed rate mortgage. Now, to follow up from a question from earlier, do we, in this scenario, get a larger mortgage interest deduction toward the beginning or toward the end? You'll notice that toward the beginning, we have a lot of mortgage interest, and toward the end, we have nearly no interest at all. And so the mortgage interest deduction primarily kicks in for the beginning portion of a mortgage, but not at the end.